In this episode of Demystifying Indian Music, we'll be looking at drones and how they're produced. Firstly, let's define what a drone is. I would say that a drone is a sustained note or sound, or a cluster of sounds. Why do we need drones? Well, drones are very useful in music of all types. If you listen to film soundtracks, in fact, next time you see a film, just pay close attention to the score and you'll see long passages of tension or calm. And then you'll hear underneath that the drone is used to create that effect. The drone is used predominantly in Indian classical music in India. And it's very difficult to find an Indian classical piece or recital without a drone in it. In the Western world, drones can be found quite commonly in folk music. And many folk instruments have drones built in them in addition to the melodic side of them. We're all very familiar with the bagpipes, and the bagpipe is actually an instrument that can play drone and melody, just like the hurdy-gurdy. If you think about bagpipes and picture what they look like, you'll remember that there's a sort of bag attachment that's pumped here with pipes sticking out of it. Those pipes are the droning pipes. In fact, they're called drones. And each one of those pipes can be tuned to a specific note whilst the player plays the melody through the chanter pipe. So both the bagpipes and the hurdy-gurdy can play melody as well as drone. So that we can get a better understanding of drones, I'm going to distinguish between two types of drones. And I'm going to say that one type of drone is actually played by the player so the player is actually making the drone by physically plucking a string or by bowing a string, for example. Another type of drone is a drone that actually sounds without the player physically touching that string. Now, how is that possible? How can, it, how can a, an instrument or a sound make a sound without a player playing it? Well, let me demonstrate something for you. I've got two tablets here that I've prepared earlier. Uh, and what I've done is I've tuned them to the same pitch. So if I was to play this one, they're tuned to the same pitch. Now, what's interesting is that when I play this tabla, this will vibrate purely by induction. The air that vibrates around this tabla when I hit it has an effect on this tabla and it's enough to, it's enough to make this tabla sound. So let's see if I can get this one to vibrate sympathetically with this one. I'm going to hit this drum and then I'll stop the sound from resonating so that you can hear this one resonate. It'll be very slight, but you should notice it. I've just heard that one finish. So it's very gentle, but nevertheless, it does resonate. In fact, I can hear this vibrate as I'm speaking to you. Ooh. You can hear that. I'll lift it up closer to the mic. Hello. It's still going. So that's really amazing, I think, that uh, something can vibrate without actually physical contact. And I would say that that's vibrating sympathetically with the sounding drum. Now, there are many um, instruments that incorporate that behavior. In fact, many pop artists, including uh, the Beatles and Bob Dylan, have detuned their guitars in a particular way so that the strings resonate more. So say, for example, they're singing a song in the key of D, um, they could have as many D strings open that vibrates naturally and it somehow gives a, a, a droning mood or a special effect to that particular song. Here's a sitar. Beautiful instrument. And um, I'm not going to play it because I can't play it and also it's not in tune. It's just, I just, I've just got this here to show you the mechanism of how it would work. 
when it's played properly. Um, I'm not sure if you can see from there, but there's a layer of strings. In fact, my hand's hitting it there. And then there's another layer of strings down here, about two centimeters lower. These strings aren't normally plucked, but they would vibrate sympathetically with the main strings. And that's what provides that sort of resonant effect of the sitar. Also, the bridge of the sitar is curved. I'm going to talk a bit uh, more about that later on, but it's curved, which, which helps it create that buzzing effect uh, and adds more harmonics and overtones to the sound. Some players actually do play the sympathetic strings, and because they're tuned to the scale of the raga, if you were to be able to reach down with your little finger and pluck them, it would make that very, very typical sitar sound that we're used to see, seeing and hearing on, on adverts and in recordings. That ding -ling 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 -ling. I won't do it now because it's out of tune. Let me, let me try it. I shouldn't have done that, should I? Anyway, you've got the idea. So you've got the main strings, then you've got the sympathetic strings on the sitar. Let's look at another instrument that does both functions. So melody and drone. This is a sarangi, which is used in Indian classical music. It's a bowed instrument, and as you can see, again, there is a top layer of strings, which are the ones that are bowed. Or maybe I think there may be one or two that are bowed. And the rest underneath are all sympathetic strings. So they would vibrate um, in sympathy with the main string. The other advantage of this is that the bridge is resting on parchment. This is actually skin. So the belly of the instrument is made of skin. And that again provides a sort of hollow drum sound which helps to accentuate the resonance in the sympathetic strings. Sarangi, beautiful instrument. Let's look at a very popular instrument uh, used in India today, and it's the harmonium, which I have in front of me here. Um, you can't see this, but the harmonium has stops along the front. I'll just try and tilt it like that so you can see it. And as you can hear, because the uh, bellows are being compressed, there is a drone sound set up, and I have a limited um, control over which drones I can choose. There's four drone knobs on here. So I can set a drone going, and then I can play a melody. Etc, etc. Very common instrument oh, and a very easy way of making a drone. But again, two in one. The ability to make a drone and also play a melody as well. Let's look at some instruments that are purely designed for making a drone and nothing else. A very portable and commonly found instrument in India is the Shruti box. S-H-R-U-T-I is how I'd spell it. And this is like the harmonium, but without the keyboard. So if I was to pump this bellow... that produces a reed drone, very similar to the harmonium. And of course I can choose from here which keys I'd like to choose or select. So that's the Shruti box. The drones that are produced for Indian classical music concerts are usually produced by the tambura, or tambora. Well, here's one here. Looks very similar in shape to a sitar, but doesn't have frets or pegs. So that's a bit of a giveaway if you're looking at it from a long distance and you want to identify. And uh, the tambura has four strings, sometimes five and uh, these are normally tuned, they can be tuned in unison or sometimes they're tuned in uh, tonic and fifths. And you have this special flat bridge, which again enables it to produce this twangy or buzzy sound. And a player would constantly play that cycle whilst the soloists perform. What's interesting about this drone and many Indian, Indian drones is that they have that buzzy, twangy effect, which normally in the West we try to get away from. So if your instrument's buzzing or your violin's buzzing, you probably want to get it fixed. Whereas uh, in India, if your instrument's not buzzing, you probably want to get it fixed. 
Now, there is a, um, a this, I spoke about the bridge earlier on, and this is a flat bridge as opposed to a sharp violin bridge or a guitar bridge. One of these strings is not twangy, and I've prepared that earlier on to demonstrate this. If I was to pluck this string, that's a cleaner sounding string compared to this one. That's got a rattle to it. And if I pluck the cleaner sounding string and then hold my finger against it, you'll hear it begin to rattle. You hear that buzz? And the bridge, the flat bridge over here, actually produces that buzz by being curved. So the string rattles against it and produces that beautiful sound that has so many harmonics and overtones. The advantage of that twangy buzzy sound is that it helps the performer, whether he or she be a singer, vocalist or an instrumentalist, to be able to pitch correctly uh, whilst they're improvising around their raga recital. Nowadays, many performers have retired the beautiful tanpura in favour of the electronic version, which I have here. This doesn't sound as good as a tanpura, but it sort of does the job. And what's great about it is you can actually change the pitch very easily without spending minutes and minutes tuning. And you can add a fifth, third, seventh, and you can turn it off. Sometimes people use instruments such as this, the gopi chand, to create a sort of drone. Now, although it's not a continuous sounding note, um, it nevertheless is a repeated pattern. So I'm going to also say that this is a type of drone used in India. This has got one string down the middle of it and I could play a, pluck out a simple rhythm. Gopi Chand. <laughs> 